<laughs> That's got to be hard with all this good weather we're having, too, Dick. Oh, you're very welcome. And in your handout, you'll see the kind of an outline, and then there's a little worksheet on the back of that for dealing with temptation and kind of figuring out uh, what your strengths and weaknesses are and maybe a strategy to help you. And then the parent page uh, is actually two pages, which also has some good information. And many times that parent page kind of has some of the information that we'll cover in class as well, just as a good review for you. Has that been helpful for people? Uh, or or am, am I just wasting paper? OK. Well, keep it up then. And a good, good reminder for your children, for, for you to teach your children and your grandchildren. Other prayer requests for CJ? Anybody else? Prayer request. Betty? Okay. And also pray for JT, or not JT, uh, pray for Ken Lay. He had, JT's had so many surgeries, I guess he came to my mind, but Ken Lay had surgery today. Uh, so just pray for Ken and his healing as well. And help me remind myself to repeat the comments. I don't think I'm going to repeat necessarily the prayer requests, but I will try to repeat the comments during class. So, And our, our opening question is going to be, what are some of the worst effects of sin in our world? And or what are some of the ways life would be so different if, it, if the world was not corrupted by sin? So we'll try to imagine a world without sin and after a few moments, we'll, we'll talk about that. So any other prayer requests for CJ? Why don't you go ahead and lead us, CJ?
Amen. So I'll repeat the, those opening question options for us. What are some of the worst effects of sin? We're trying to imagine a world totally without sin. And, uh, or you could answer this other one. What are some of the ways life would be very different if uh, the world was not corrupted by sin? I'll go first. And the first thing I thought about, well, if there's, there's no sin in the world, there would be no church, right? Because, you know, we wouldn't need the Lord. We'd still be in unbroken fellowship with him. And uh, it would be a pretty neat situation that everybody would have that. Uh, in a sense, you would call God's people everybody that populated the face of the earth if there was no sin in the world. That was one thing that I thought of, maybe one of the first things. How about uh, any other ideas? Yeah. yeah, it'd be like one big church, a universal worldwide planet Earth church, you know, so we'd all care for one another. What, what else? Any other ideas? DJ? We'd all have faith. We'd be having no doubt. That's what CJ was, was saying. Anybody else have a thought? Bob? Right. No, be, no pain, no injury, no sickness, um, no hospitals, no doctors. Um, it'd be quite a place, wouldn't it? I'd be out of a job. <laughs> so Bill and I would both be out of jobs Scott and Matt would be out of jobs <laughs> I'm sure we, God would put us to work doing something else uh, very significant so um, anybody else have a thought Bob, Bob said that Pam said that, that we may not have insurance agents either, but Bob thinks we might because bad driving isn't necessarily a sin. It could be just a mistake. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and, and move into the, the text here. Genesis chapter 3. And as we, we think about this, you know, we, we realize that sin and its entrance into the world really changed everything. You know, we start imagining a world without sin, and that's really kind of what we look forward to in uh, heaven, I think, is what we're, we're part of what we're imagining, what that, that might be like. And yet, sin came to the world and changed everything, and uh, some of the effects of sin are greater than other effects, uh, yet the consequences of sin are felt by all of us, all people in the world. And so you, you have your outline there. Could I have a reader for uh, Genesis chapter 3 and beginning in verse 1? And then we're going to just read through the first part of verse 6. And you know, just think about where we left off in Genesis chapter 2 and, and verse 25. Uh, we ended on a very tranquil scene as, as Adam and Eve were living in a perfect world. And uh, we, we think that there's... Uh, Really, uh, chapter 3 we come to, and we see that we're really ready to uh, take a drastic turn for the worse as we enter chapter 3. Would someone read uh, Genesis chapter 3, Peter? 1 through the first part of verse 6.
Thank you. So we just read through there. What, what is the part of the temptation about this fruit? It was desirable in what ways? Okay, we could become like God, and don't some people kind of want to be like God even today? It's still a, a temptation to have that kind of power and be at least God over their own life. So what, what else is tempting about this fruit? It was desirable. Uh, obviously, there's several different aspects of that desirability, we could say. Could become wise, and certainly uh, don't some people utilize the internet to become quote unquote wise? It doesn't work very well in many aspects, uh, but there's still that strong desire though. I mean, how many hours and hours are spent uh, on the internet each day by many people? Uh, so, but it's certainly gaining godly wisdom is a great thing to have and certainly something that we can gain from the scriptures and applying those to our lives. So that's a, that's a positive thing. It was desirable for gaining wisdom. It, had a, it was good looking. It was beautiful. It had a beauty to it. And certainly that's uh, something that's tempting to us today as well. We see someone or something that's beautiful, and uh, we can think, boy, you know, I would like that thing over there because it's very attractive. We understand it probably was tasty, at least it looked like it was tasty. They hadn't eaten it before, so they didn't know, but it looked like it was, was tasty. Again, our appetites, we you know, love to feed those, those appetites. Anything else that you say, Betty? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a really good, really good observation. Really good observation because um, at first reading, you kind of miss that Adam was there, but then later it says, and Adam was right there with Eve. And so I, I've used this illustration before that it's a really te a temptation for us as, as males in our leadership role. We see I believe we see Adam really not fulfilling that in this instance. You know, if you or I were out in our garden and we had snakes or serpents around, wouldn't we have something called a shovel? You know, and what would be our first inclination is just to cut that serpent's head right off. Boom. You know, and uh, certainly that would be a protection that we should be as males offering our family by protecting our families and taking that leadership role and being that kind of a spiritual influence in a positive way. Bill? I think it's also worth noticing that that, that tree was the only thing in the entire garden they could not have. Good. And there's something about human nature that makes that pretty enticing. Good. It also tells us a lot about God. He, he makes almost everything accessible to us in, in many ways, and yet there are very few things that are really restrictions. You know, and I think it's, it's a good lesson for those of us who are parents or grandparents as well, that we maybe should try to think about, can I say yes to this if, if it's a valid request, or do I just have to, because of what God says, say no? You know, and not, not we, in, in essence, as a parent or a grandparent, pick your battles. Don't make everything a battle. Uh, it seemed like God said, hey, everything's open for you except this one thing. You know, he only chose one battle for Adam and Eve. And I think that's, that's a good, good thing for us to uh, consider as well. Dick? Good, good comment, Dick. Thank you. Um, any other thoughts here? We really see a, a, a contrast between Genesis 1 and 2 and Genesis 3. Uh, God did all the speaking in Genesis 1 and 2, and what happened? Life. Everything that God spoke came to life, right? 
And then we get to Genesis chapter 3, and Satan speaks up, and the result of his speaking is death, just the opposite. Kind of a, an interesting thought, but it really we're, we're reminded that all of us are still in a spiritual battle, right? That there's an ongoing spiritual battle that each and every one of us that's involved in and is engaged in, and it's so important to remember that. You know, when something really weird happens, I, I, we just did our, uh, our leadership emergence uh, team meeting uh, this, this last uh, Monday, and I read my narrative over again, which I've, I've done, and I thought, boy, you know, when something really oddball happens, it's really a lot of times an indicator that Satan's at work. That this is probably something that really is indicating part of a spiritual battle in our life. And, uh, you know, we need to have our antenna up and be ready. Oh, wait a minute, what's going on here? Uh, and I don't claim to always have my antenna up, uh, as much, maybe as well as I should, but uh, sometimes retrospect, I see, oh, that's what was going on. This has really been a spiritual battle here. And certainly, uh, I think we could apply that to this time of COVID-19. You know, why are people so upset on one extreme or the other about a mask? You know, you think anybody's behind that? You know, I, I think it's part of that spiritual battle. I think it is. Um, certainly, none of us like wearing a mask. I don't know of anybody that I've ever talked to likes doing that, but is it really a matter of salvation? No, it's really not. It's really insignificant. and. I think it was Marvin Phillips that said, and he is a, a Church of Christ preacher, he said, what the, the Satan, the devil's always trying to do is to distract us with lesser things than what God would have us be focused on. I think that was really a, a great insight, and certainly it applies today as much as it did during the time that he, he spoke that uh, saying. I think it's a, a good thing for us to think. So we're in that spiritual battle. Uh, temptation comes in a disguise. I don't think Adam and Eve woke up that morning and said, oh, you know, we're going to be really tempted today. And then this serpent comes up and says, oh, that's, that's the temptation. You know, I don't think they even knew what was happening during that time. So many times temptation comes at us from uh, just kind of weird areas of our lives. And so if we, we think about this whole situation, how did Satan, through the serpent, use lies and deception in his temptation of Adam and Eve? What, what are some of the ways that uh, you see deception used in that scenario that we, we read through in verses 1 through 6? Pam? Yeah? Okay. Did God really say you can't eat? of that? Did God, did God really say that? Is that really what God's word says? You know, we get a lot of that today, don't we? Does God's word really say we have to be baptized into Christ? Yeah, it does. It's very clear, isn't it? We, we get that. Um, so there's really that, that challenge to uh, God's word. And, and as, as uh, CJ brought out, the doubt, bringing out doubt. Doubting God's word. Did he really, really say that? What else do you see as part of Satan's deception in this context? I, I see kind of a, uh, I guess, a questioning of God's intent. Is God really doing this for your good? Is this really good? Or is he trying to keep something really good away from you? You know, isn't God trying to spoil your life? by putting these, these commandments in there? Um, no, he's trying to bless us. God's will is our, for our good. It's always for our best. And when we sin, when we choose to do something different, we're really sacrificing, fast sacrificing God's best for our own personal lives. Um, other, other dis, I guess, uh, disguises or distractions there that you see deceptions of, of uh, God's word or anything else that you notice? Okay. Yeah. 
good, Dick. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, really, you know, I think Satan's denying the deadly consequences. Will you surely die if you eat this? Is that right? You think you'll really die? You know, sin always has consequences, right? And we know that. Um, sometimes uh, we see those pretty quickly. Sometimes they are revealed later on. Um, I was reading a book oh, some months ago. It was talking about a very influential Christian leader who uh, had all kinds of things going on, and he had really kind of a worldwide ministry, but then it came to light that he had a mistress in almost every city he went to. And right after that was discovered, he was confronted, and he denied it, although they had proof. And right after that, he got cancer in his eye. Because I really, really believe God was at work, and he ended up dying about two weeks later. Because he didn't want to deal with the obvious sin in his life. Um, you know, that was the author's conclusion, you know, which uh, God only knows how, how that was all connected, but go ahead. CJ just mentioned that a couple of scriptures, Romans 1 and Proverbs 6, that uh, sin always has consequences, and, and there's really a, a reason that God gives us those. Uh, if you just read the, the basic message of the prophets in the Old Testament, it was really kind of a twofold message. The first was, you know, turn to me, and then if you don't, the second part was, Judgment is nearer than it has ever been. You know, and that was really the message of the Old Testament prophets. Um, turn to me, learn from me, listen to me. And uh, if you don't, judgment will never be any closer than it is right now. So, you know, a, a very, very uh, big, uh, again, message from God's word. Uh, again, it seems like uh, Satan, again, is kind of questioning the character and the goodness and the intent of God. Uh, so, again, we, we want to move on to the next section here, just how, how are lies of deception part of every temptation? And Satan wants us to think that giving in to temptation will bring certain things like lasting pleasure, satisfaction, and contentment. And, and this is a lie. You know, those temptations, it's always going to look good, it, it's always going to be kind of beautiful. It's always going to look kind of tasty. It's always going to look uh, like it'll fulfill our appetites and our desires. It's always going to look like we can gain power and prestige, like being like God or having uh, this great knowledge or wisdom. Um, and these are really the same temptations that we read about in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. Or if we consider Jesus' temptation in Mark 4, or Luke 4, really is basically the same temptations. So uh, Satan hasn't changed his game plan, you know, so we can know that, right? Now we know what his strategy is. If you're in sports and you're a leader on the sports team or a coach, what do you want to know about the other team? What is their strategy? What are they going to try to do? How can, we, how can we know that and how can we prevent that? So fortunately, God's word gives us the way to, to know that and to uh, understand that and be aware of those kinds of things. And as we said, uh, Adam was making a choice to sin much as, as much as Eve was. And uh, certainly, uh, there were some consequences that uh, came about from that. Let's go ahead and read verses 6 through 13. So I want to read verses 6 through 13 of Genesis chapter 3. 
Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 through 13. Anybody? Bob, thank you. Thank you, Bob, for reading that. And so as we, we consider this particular uh, context, uh, we, we definitely realize, we've already kind of talked about it, Adam doesn't get a pass here. Uh, he was right there watching, uh, and we talked about his passivity, uh, failing to spiritually lead in this situation. And uh, so as we, we think about Adam and Eve's sin, what were some of those consequences of their sin? What were some of those consequences that we, we noticed right away, Bill? Good. So that, that shame and, you know, what's the difference between guilt and shame? You know, s- guilt is something that we feel bad about. Are we seeing that Adam and Eve are really feeling guilty and wanting to deal with this in their relationship with God? Not really, are we? Do we see that with other people today? You know, they, they are guilty, but they don't want to admit it. And... Uh, so, go ahead, Bob. No, I, I, I was just thinking that sometimes I've said to people when they, you know, claim they turn it over their head and they claim that they don't. I, I'll say, do they take it under your head? Just, just, I'd like to think, that Bob was just saying that, you know, the, the situation that sometimes people say, well, I, I didn't really want to do it, but I did it, and Bob's question to them is, did they have a gun to your head? Did someone have a gun to your head and force you to do that? And, of course, the answer was no. And uh, as we, we, we think about that, I think we'd like to all think, you know, Adam and Eve really blew it, and we've really inherited a bunch of problems from them, but, you know, if it was you or I in the garden... I wouldn't have done any better. Maybe I would have done worse. And uh, we, we maybe would, would think about that. But uh, kind of going back to that the idea between guilt and shame, um, you know, when we're, we're guilty, you know, that means we, we basically miss the mark. That's when we sin. It's kind of an archery term. You know, the arrow is shot and it doesn't hit the bullseye. And... Uh, you know, that's, that's really what sin is. We're not, we're not hitting God's mark. We're not hitting God's target. And uh, that, then we normally, that would 
would create in us something that, well, man, I knew better and I didn't do better. And so that, that's, we are guilty in God's judgment uh, because he said this is the standard that we have to meet and uh, we're not meeting that standard. Shame kind of more becomes, I become, my identity becomes kind of tied to that behavior. That no longer am a person, am I a person who has stolen, but now I am a thief. You see the difference between that, I Bill? Think of it as guilt is I did a bad thing, shame is I'm a bad person. Good, good, good clarification. So sin is I, I did a bad thing, guilt is I am a bad person. Right. Sin is breaking God's law, guilt is I did a bad thing, shame is I am a bad person. And so you know, we, we see that in people even today, and I think it's more prevalent than it used to be maybe 30 years ago. Um, I think the shame becomes more, uh, I guess, a part of people and who, how they view themselves in this day and time, which is harder to deal with if you really have that tied to your identity. I'm a bad person versus I did a bad thing. You see the difference there that makes sense? And, but we see both of those with Adam and Eve here, in, in a sense. And uh, sin always has those consequences. It always brings those consequences. And what are some of those, those consequences? What are, what are some of the consequences we see here? Obviously, separation. Separation, our sins separate us from God. You know, what is it? Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23. Uh, what does that say, that your sins have separated you from God? And uh, so, you know, that's a pretty basic study for us when we study with people who aren't yet uh, Christians. We understand that. Um, what, what are some other consequences of their sin that we, we see evidenced in this particular text? What's that? I'm sorry. They had to work, okay, yeah, they had to go to work, which was a, a good thing nowadays, I think, but uh, I, I think about fear, uh, the hiding, as we've already talked about, blaming other people. Isn't that our tendency? It's somebody else's fault. Uh, it's easy to uh, fall into that. And so when we, we start thinking about these kinds of, of things, we, we miss out on God's uh, best for our lives, and other people do the same thing. Um, I love to, this next question. What are some steps we can take to help us overcome temptation? You know, all of us are going to be tempted. And uh, all of us have to learn to, one thing to do is we can remove ourselves from that temptation, right? Like when I first became a Christian, I wasn't raised in a Christian family. And my custom was to go hang out with my friends, both male and female, at the bar. So how do I remove that temptation? Don't go to the bar, right? Which that's what I did. And then they thought I was crazy and I was better than they were, etc. And those are the accusations that came. But I knew I had to do that. I had to remove myself from that temptation. Otherwise, my Christianity would have probably just gone down the drain. CJ? Good. Amen. So admit you are tempted in that area. Know your weakness. And that's part of the, what that worksheet does, um, that if you take the time to work through that, uh, it's on the back of the outline there. I think that's helpful. Um, so we, we really we talk about uh, removing ourselves, uh, resisting the temptation, identifying it, as, as CJ has mentioned, and uh, really also just... Uh, 
you know, once you realize, you know, sometimes temptation comes in weird ways. And you say, oh, wait a minute. Uh, I didn't see that coming at all, but I'm out of here. I'm, I haven't been able to avoid it, but I'm going to remove myself. And I think uh, what we're talking about resisting, a lot of times the best way to resist is through prayer and the scriptures and letting that really change the way we think and what's really in our hearts. Betty? Amen. He told, he told her that God, God would, that she would die because of his age and an explanation of something. You don't have to have an explanation of something because whatever the scripture says, the scripture says. Yeah. And I, I think that's a sure way. Yeah. Just, so Betty said that uh, the best way to. S- you know, resist temptation is just to stick with the scriptures. And if someone says the scriptures say something different than they actually say, then just go with what the scriptures say. I, I think of a, a man by the name of Francis Chan, and uh, Francis really didn't be, you know, he really isn't necessarily a part of our fellowship, but he does practice baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and he was teaching on that one day, and someone questioned him and said, you mean you believe that you have to be baptized to become a Christian? He said to that person, read that verse out loud to me. Read that verse out loud to me. And they did say, well, I guess that's what it says, isn't it? You know, it's pretty clear. And uh, it's been kind of exciting to see some other religious Christian groups kind of coming to understand that baptism is an essential part of our relationship with God, and uh, praise God that that they are reading God's word and seeing that on their own. Dick. Yeah. Good. 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 So you're right. It, be, know what the scriptures say, memorize the scriptures, and part of our assignment today is to, to memorize the first five books of the Old Testament, their names, not the whole thing, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, right? I think probably most everybody understood that, so uh, that, that's, that's a good thing, though, and, and teach those to your children and to your grandchildren if they, uh, if they don't have that uh, memorized it's a good place to start. Start with five. You know, we only got 61 left to go, right? <laughs> it's, it's all good. So anyway, um, as we, we kind of wind down uh, this evening, I want to ask the question, what does this, uh, God was aware that Adam and Eve would sin even before he created them and that his son would have to redeem them. What does that tell you about God? What does that tell you about God? Obviously, God says, how did you know that you were naked? You know, did he do that for, because he didn't know that? No, he knew. God is omniscient. He knows everything. And God knew that they would sin when he created them. But what does that tell us about God? That in spite of our tendency to rebel against God, he still created us. What does that tell us about God? It just shows us how much he desperately wants a relationship with us. Yeah. Even, even in the text. So they felt shame, so they made this pathetic attempt to clothe him with fig leaves or something. But then later in the text, you actually see God's grace when he makes them a real set of clothing and they actually can be protected by it when they brought into that. These are some skins, which maybe we could call the first sacrifice. Um, you know, that God made for Adam and Eve. So we see really a high value on humanity that uh, his wanting our our relationship with us was really worth the life of his son. We see that high value. He loved us that much, a great, another high value on love because we have to choose to love him. He makes everything available for us, but it's our choice. He doesn't force us to have that relationship with him. Anything else you you notice about God there? 
Uh, the only other thing that uh, I, I wanted to mention is he, he suffered great personal loss because of you, because of me, by sacrificing his son so we could have that relationship with him. Well, and again, just to remind you that you, about your daily devotions, uh, again, today you'll be on page 28, week 4. Uh, in, the, in the green one, if you have the blue one, it might be a little bit different, but uh, in the green one, uh, that's page 28, uh, week 4 is where we're starting. And we'll go ahead and close out with that. Thank you all for your comments. Thanks for being here. I will put my mask back on and uh, hope to see you on Saturday. downstairs please go and pick those up right away that would be good the teachers will appreciate that and may be some food also in the fellowship hall. If you want to take any of that home with you, feel free on your way out.